Madden Luke's Sci-Fi Sanctuary. The year is 3013. The galaxy is scintillating in the mellow light. Two galactic pilgrims seek out vistas in the samurai future to bring forth the unity of the cosmic shaman. Opening the door of the Pantheon of Mystics, the evil sorcerer wizard powers the engine of science, seeking to forever alter the sacred balance, traveling on effervescent balls of summer fire. This week, the creation of the humanoids. In the year 1968, Philip K. Dick wrote Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? But six years earlier, he was beaten to the punch. With what? With... Wait, I always want to say creation of the Inhumanoids. <laughs> but that's not what it's called. <laughs> okay, get it right then. Creation of the Humanoids. Yes. Right. From 1962. This is a movie that was not at all on my radar. I hadn't heard of it till you told me to watch it. Exactly. So um, usually we get into like where we first got into the film, but actually we need to get straight into the guest uh, because I heard about this film from the guest from our uh, actually talking to one of our past guests, uh, Charlie Robinson. And um, in the podcast, he mentioned several times. One, he mentioned Metropolis and this creation of the humanoids in like the same sentence several times. So that certainly piqued my curiosity. And then the this kind of concept coming in 1962 is pretty wild as well. So um, our guest today is Ken Ami, who uh, looks into transhumanism. He's written an entire library of books, I believe. Uh, so hi, Ken. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. H- how many books have you written? I always joke that I should know my own canon, but I haven't counted in a while. So m- maybe 45-ish or so. Okay, wow. yeah, I just like saw the list going on. I, I had a look at a few of them, but I was like, I, I, I'm definitely not going to cover all of these before we talk to you. <laughs> but I think uh, four, and I'm working on my fifth one about uh, movies in particular. So that's always been a fun subject for me. Well, yeah, you're, you're on the Sci-Fi Sanctuary. Oh, yeah, we didn't introduce her. We introduced our guest first. This oh, is yeah. <laughs> this, this is, is Matt. Luke. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Sci-Fi Sanctuary. Yeah. Okay, you, you got the first introduction. Very cool today. <laughs> I mean, I, they probably know that once they've clicked on it. Yeah, yeah, if you're here, you, you might know I'll run the already. show. You guys will be the guests. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> awesome, easy. Well, in, in a way, um, the, you're on point on this movie. How did you come across this one? Because I, I feel like I'm pretty well knowledgeable of like you know sci-fi caught sci-fi weird stuff and this one was just completely under my radar so how, how did you come across this one well i wanted to actually take a minute uh for your japanese audience and say toy wa do koreska i hope we have a japanese audience yeah <laughs> <laughs> we live in japan but i don't think many japanese folks listen i did get a little marketing you know yeah. <laughs> just, just put the name of your show, and under it, the the motto could be Toire wa do Goreska. Yeah, we can we can try. We can do that. I did get one Japanese girl. She's like, oh, you do podcasts? I want to listen. <laughs> and she's like, I can't understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> that is the problem, because it's, it's kind of like um, even, you know, uh, Luke's from the UK, so even uh, with comedy, this was 10, 15 years ago, another guy from the UK was just trying to introduce me to some comedy, and even there, like, there was just like a little disconnect with the stand-up. Stand-up was like especially hard, so. I've had to reinvent how I talk so Americans will understand me. <laughs> comedy is notoriously difficult to translate, because so much of it is cultural and based on puns and double entendres, and it's, it's notoriously right, difficult. Right, so... Yeah, with the podcast, you know, we can kind of sell it in Japan, like, hey, here's a way to improve your English, but it's it's kind of a difficult way. <laughs> well, they, I have had Japanese people listen to my other one, my Pokemon one, because it's just me talking very slowly, so they can handle that. <laughs> uh, hey, I did want to, before jumping into this one, I, I did want to mention something to you guys. When you discussed Metropolis, I remember somebody mentioning that Dr. Strangelove was modeled after Rotwag. Yeah, 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 yeah. That. coming up. Yeah, now, uh, to me, he struck me as also the inspiration for Darth Vader, if I may say so. I could see that. Um, 
I mean, he's he's got the whole, um, you know, wearing a black trench overcoat rather than Darth Vader's cape. And then um, he's an occultist and Darth Vader is referred to as a sorcerer, you know. And then uh, there's the whole losing of the hand trope. They both lose a hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can yeah. see that. That's what I was... And then uh, just yeah. to add on, I'd also seen something... Oh, I don't remember a name. I just saw the image maybe two days ago. It was like a 1938-1939 serial where they had a villain also with a, a helmet. Not not exactly like Darth Vader's, but you could see where they might well, cross in a bit of that. Star well. Wars was very deliberately homaging that yeah, period yeah, of cinema, but, right? So I'm sure Metropolis is on his mind. Yeah. I mean, look at C-3PO, right? He got the Kurosawa in, so why not the, uh, why not the Kubrick as well? Sure, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, anyhow, uh, this movie, honestly, I have no idea how I ran across it. I don't recall that whatsoever, but... I was blown away by it and still am to this day to the point that I did include a review of it in my book, Transhuman Hollywood. And I guess the thing for me is, um, <clears throat> in many ways, yes, it is like schlocky sci-fi. It's basically a five-act play that somebody wrote and put to film. The, the production standards aren't the highest, but someone really wrote that screenplay. I mean, the ideas are wild. Well, okay. That, so, yeah, that was very interesting. I saw that in your notes. And so the background here is that in 1954, Jack Williamson wrote a book titled The Humanoids. Okay, now the screenwriter for this movie, Jay Stills, he combined that book with uh, Cable Capex 1920 play RURU, which refers to Rosam's Universal Robot. So it is partly based on a play. So I think you read that very uh, well into the movie. Yeah, because uh, for me, I, I watch movies in clips. So it's like, oh, when does the scene end? Hey, this scene goes on for a while. So, <laughs> and so I, I think that um, from what I understand, the Humanoids book doesn't contain the elements that makes this movie, to me, just absolutely uh, outstanding. So it was, uh, you know, Jay Stills, a screenwriter, uh, just put the ingredients together into a, a fantastic movie. So if you want to watch uh, fantastic cinematographical vistas and Shakespearean-level acting and mind-tingling special effects, then watch a different movie. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, let's give it a break. Okay, it's 1962. They worked with what they had. But for me, anyhow, movie reviews are never about that. For me, it's all about the worldview behind it, the philosophy and in this case, the transhumanism, which inevitably always combines um, evolution, high tech and the occult. This is just no way of really getting around that. It's always like a package deal. And to me, this movie is still unmatched in its sophistication on the level of how it weaves together a tale of uh, high tech and humanity's reaction to it and relationship with it and fear of it as well as occult concepts and evolution and there's so much to it yeah i guess partly because of the soundtrack one of my thoughts was forbidden planet and i was like well the the production standards are obviously down here but as far as like the the why you know the ideas to think about have, have quite uh, been boosted in this one a little bit <laughs> well, yeah, a lot and by the way i i, I consider the the 2014 um, Gabe Ibanez movie Automata, I consider that like a more watered down version of this movie, honestly. Well, that, put that one on the list. Yeah, what was your hot take on this one? Yeah, so I watched it literally last night on YouTube, actually. Um, and it's similar to you. It's like the disparity between the filmmaking and like the writing and the ideas is huge. As a film, like just to look at, it looks like a cheap TV movie, but the, and it, you never really see the things they're talking about. They just talk about them. But the ideas expressed were like, they feel like they'd be fairly groundbreaking today. And here is a film from 1962 giving us this stuff. Yeah. So it's a weird, Correct. A weird like two sided I, yes. thing. Well, uh, I guess what I'm going to do is just, um, you know, this is an episode where people may or may not have seen the film, but like Luke said, and like I watched it, we watched it on YouTube, so it's an easy find. Yeah, literally just type the humanoids into YouTube <laughs> and it'll come up. But in the meantime, I'm going to take a minute and just spoil the entire plot for everybody.
After a nuclear war, the surviving 8% of the human race begins to rebuild using robots. These become more and more human-like over time, while the human race itself suffers from a low birth rate due to the lingering radiation. Some humans, however, begin to detest these humanoid robots and have formed the Order of Flesh and Blood as a resistance force. This mostly involves bugging humanoids on the street for their walking papers. While these humanoids strive to help the human race... Oop, what happened there? Oh, okay. There we go. While these humanoids strive to help the human race, they have no emotions and want to become more human themselves. With the assistance of Dr. Raven, the humanoids have been stealing newly dead human bodies and are recreating these people as robots that are human all but for the ability to reproduce. The police storm Dr. Raven's lab and the doctor has a newly created and confused humanoid kill him before the doctor's mind can be wiped. At a meeting later that evening, the order becomes disturbed that a humanoid has killed a man, while high echelon leader Kregus has become disturbed that his sister is now in rapport with the humanoid. Kregus heads to his sister's place to confront her about the issue, but the whole thing turns into a late night party as the sister's friend Maxine appears to celebrate the rapport. For some reason, Kregus and Maxine fall in love despite their differences. But it all turns out to be robot attraction. Kregus and Maxine are corralled into a 4 a.m. interview call with the humanoids as the two are actually recently deceased humans who have been recreated in robot form. The two newly revealed humanoids slowly accept their new lot as a recreated and younger Dr. Raven has perfected the process which will allow them to regain the missing 4% of their humanity and become able to procreate. In fact, this turns out to be the step needed to allow us modern humans to exist, as Dr. Raven breaks the fourth wall at the end and reveals to the audience that what we have been seeing is actually the distant past. So we'll, we'll spend just a little bit of time on the actors and characters, maybe a little less here than, than usual, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the, in terms of acting characters, the first one I want to talk about is the humanoids themselves. Yeah, they're very Commander Data. Yeah, they felt... Like, was there anything before this that did that kind of robot? Where it's, they pretty much look human, but how they act is what makes them robots. Could this be the first? Well, let's let's uh, just elucidate something for a moment, because the the very beginning of the movie shows a progression in technology. So uh, what happens within this film is that there's been an atomic war. Right. And it devastated the Earth. Uh, Now, uh, interestingly enough, as a plot point, it's stated that no one can be sure who started it. And that really is is unimportant, which is interesting because you can't take sides now, you can't point fingers, then it's irrelevant. It's like, this is a fact, this is what happened, let's just move on with life, right? And now we have to, we're having to deal with declining levels of human population. And so they start uh, building uh, mechanical devices, which are very clunky, until then they develop robots, right? But then they end up developing the humanoids. And the difference is that the humanoids are what we would call androids. So they're anthropomorphic robots. So there's a key distinction in the movie itself between robots and, and humanoids. So, for example, the, the uh, surveillance committee of the flesh and bone. Don't forget, that's what they're called. The surveillance, surveillance committee. Surveillance committee, yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, the surveillance committee of the flesh and, and blood, actually. Um, they're not against robots. They're just against against humanoids for reasons that we'll end up getting into. I'm did, sure. I, did I say flesh and blood? I think you said flesh and blood. Blood. Okay. Uh, I just wonder uh, if I got it wrong. <laughs> I was. I was... 
It is. Yeah, I was typing that that one yeah. sort of on my my own without referencing things from as, memory. <laughs> as the sci-fi like movie geek, the scene of the the progression of robots to humanoids. That was a real treat. Well, they make the, the they also make the big note that people were not comfortable working with the robotic forms that had relative sentience. That's interesting because in recently we have been getting closer and closer to this, and what we've actually discovered is that the uncanny valley is people are more comfortable when it's less human, which I guess the film does then get into with the order of flesh and blood. Yeah, they definitely are not into the uncanny valley. Yeah. <laughs> Um, which I know I put in my notes several times for this one. But um, yeah, I know because in Japan they have the, um, it's like in retirement homes, they now have like robots to basically move around some yes. of the older patients. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they... And like they'll, they'll stroke their hands and tell them, you know, your family misses you. They wish they could be here, stuff right. like that. But they don't look humanoid. They're still yeah. pretty robotic no, looking. No. And, um 15 years ago, we had Asimo, which was kind of a cute little Honda robot. Oh, a cute little, who knows what they'll do in the end. But <laughs> Yeah, there's still, there's the, I can't remember what it's called, the one that you sometimes see in, like, malls. Called, like, Weibo or something. Oh, the moving around, the, basically a moving iPad, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah they, and... <laughs> walks around and tells you things. Most of them don't seem to have English, though, annoyingly. Right, right. <laughs> I know the Dubai ones have a lot. Well, okay, should we bring up Dubai? What is it? Last year they like made a, a robot a citizen. Does oh, anyone, really? Anyone hear about this? They've got their own number five, Johnny Five. That sounds right. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of going off memory. But yeah, they did a Johnny Five in Dubai. Well, yeah, I hadn't heard that. <laughs> so that's pretty wild. Um, well, I guess we'll just do a quick note. So yeah, the humanoid actors. Yeah, I definitely thought of Commander Data. Um being a little green was weird. It gave him kind of a zombie look. I was just thinking the Blue Man Group the whole time, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as I said, we're we're a fully bald podcast on our end now. So uh, I was going to say, you know, Commander Data had like a little hair to chill people out, whereas these guys did not. They, yeah. they came across a little bit stranger in the end. Oh, you know. However, sometimes sorry. Uh, however, sometimes they will insert artificial eyeballs, right, to mo to look more human, such as the one who is in rapport. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was that yeah. was pretty weird. So I, you know, I guess as time goes on, they'd probably make a few more uh, things to make people more comfortable, unless get them a hairpiece. Right, you know? exactly. <laughs> I just remembered. Oh, sorry, sorry. Look. <laughs> in um in Star Trek Picard, we saw the like the the new synthetics and they looked exactly like these they yeah. were like bald bluish datas yeah were they golden or blue i th i remember them being bluish okay you might be right but yeah yeah but they were they were much more like the humanoids <laughs> um i think we've already kind of said that there's not that much to say about the actors here but i just want to note one of the names is um Dudley Manlove, which is one of the best actor names ever, and he and he had been in uh, Plan Nine from Outer Space, which oh, wow. is also of note. So <laughs> I just got to call that out. <laughs> I don't I, even know which one he was. <laughs> the principal two or three members of cast were were pretty good at what they were doing. Like Doctor Raven, I'm just trying to get the actors' names now. Um, he wasn't like the best mad scientist I've ever seen, but he had some presence. It played to me like you went to the community theater and, and it was fine. You're like, oh, they were pretty good. You know, in a movie, maybe it's not the best, but, you know, community theater acting, this, this is fine. <laughs> so yeah. Don Doolittle was Dr. Raven and Don McGowan was um, Craig, Craigus, was that his name? Craigus. Was, Craigus, yeah. yeah that, well, that one kept confusing me. That's a weird name. But yeah, those two were, I guess, the leads. If yeah. you don't count the humanoids themselves. Yeah. They, they did the job well enough. And the sister? Francis McCann. Okay, so we got we got the names down. Yeah. Uh, can you have anything you want to say about the acting before we, we get into the deeper uh, side of the pool? Just that on occasion, the acting is so bad that it's actually captivating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe that's the community theater thing. <laughs> not, not to slight your community theaters. But. <laughs> well, particularly when we get into the order of flesh and blood, and like... They're painted as being like this basically hate group. But we get into their meeting and it's all so polite and civilized and like orderly. And I expected there to be more like rabble rousing and shouting and aggression. It's like, oh, well, you know, it's probably OK. We can probably do this. Let's uh, it's just an industrial accident. But, you know, let's get rid of them anyway. <laughs> I was expecting much more 
we do if you if you recall by the end of the movie and i mean we already spoiled it right i guess if if you haven't watched it you've had since 1962 to watch it so if you haven't we're going to ruin it okay you recall at the end of the movie it turns out that they're also terrorists <laughs> Yeah, I mean that. That's yeah. That's how uh, the woman died. Um, Craigus set off a yeah. Cra Craigus was involved in that domestic act of domestic terrorism. So yeah, they're uh, they they just sort of are, are almost like a self styled organization that somehow has the authority to to go around. You know, I mean that again they call themselves the surveillance committee. So every now and then they'll stop a humanoids and ask them for papers. Where are you going? And all of this. And then, yeah, they have their civil, their meetings are very civil. I'm sure the Nazi ones were as well. And, uh, but on the other hand, yeah, they, they do act, um, perpetrate at least one act of uh, terrorism in order to make their point, I suppose. But the impression I got was that the humanoids just have to obey humans. So the Order don't really have any legal authority, but they can go around and harass robots. Right, I mean, that's the... Because the, the humanoid they harass right at the start, so they say, well, what if we make you stay here all day? He's like, well, I would have to report that to the police. But he can't stop them doing it. Right, that that discussion goes, uh, let me see your assignment cards. What are you clickers doing out tonight? And maybe we should uh, just take a second to explain here. Uh, the movie explains that a derogatory name for the humanoids was clickers, Right. And the, the clickers, the humanoids, they say, we're on free time. We're not obligated to answer. But they say, as a member of the Surveillance Committee of the Order of the Flesh and Blood, I demand an answer. And then they say, we're going to the temple to be recharged. So it's, it's interesting, that interaction, which is that they have no authority to stop these humanoids or ask them anything. But it turns out that maybe just to get them off their back, they do end up answering them. Yeah, that was how I read it, was just it's easier not to cause the scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is um, definitely follows sort of the, the Asimov rules of robotics. And I believe uh, you mentioned yes. the Russian play, which even has an earlier version of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, most movies bend or break it. And this one really doesn't until the humanoids become almost, you know, quote unquote human. Well, yeah, what I liked was that the um, when we finally find out what is going on, they are genuinely still just trying to help. Yeah. Which the iRobot movie tried to do that, but it got a bit ridiculous with it and they were still going around, you know, causing violence and killing people. <laughs> Whereas in this, like the, the big bad plot of the humanoids is just we're trying to save the human race. <laughs> well, it's just that uh, we, what you end up finding out is that all along the humanoids were doing things uh, that were very... Um cryptic or esoteric they were doing things that were not very well known until the end you find out uh, for example where they these humanoids were going to get recharged is a specific building into which they go and they call it okay so part of the plot is that the humanoids begin to develop a theology of their own right which is fascinating and so they start referring to this building as the temple and the, the mainframe, as it were, the computer, they start referring to it as the father mother, which uh, it's interesting. It, it touches upon the uh, kind of gender issues we're dealing with today, right? Because obviously it's a computer. It's not male or female. So they just kind of call it sort of the all encompassing term uh, father mother. And that's what we end up finding out is that they're starting to do things, which is to build um, the next the next level of uh, humanoids all on their own with some human help by the way but in general they are kind of keeping it to themselves like they're like we're helping the human race but they're not really keeping humans like abreast of what they're doing which is an interesting no. point yeah they've kind of taken it upon themselves to decide what's best for us in a way which you could extrapolate to ai deciding today what's best for us <laughs> yeah true <laughs> Um, real 
quick, I just want to talk a little bit about the design, I guess. Um, I mean, it, it, it was kind of like, I guess, early Jetsons. I mean, on you know. A little, yeah. It was like, that same 60s flavor. Disneyland Dark Ride sort of look. <laughs> You're obsessed with Disneyland Dark Rides. <laughs> I am. I was in the hospital for a few weeks and I watched like like the entire run of like extinct attractions at theme parks. <laughs> But um, yeah, this this it, while the design like I'd like to see more world building. Of course, um, they didn't have the budget for that or or the technical ability at this point in time to do that. But um, you know what was there? It was nice, but obviously it would have been cool to see more. That's true, huh? I guess the, the whole movie essentially takes place in like four different rooms. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> Act Two and Act Five is the same uh, laboratory, isn't it? Yeah. So. <laughs> Because um, they build up so much at the beginning with the prologue, as you said, explaining how all this came to be, which is, yeah, I guess that's all the world building they're going to do. And from there, uh, moving on. I just, because these scenes were kind of static, I was staring at, like, um, in, in the um, sister's apartment, I was, like, staring at the, the lantern above, or the uh, light above her table, trying to wonder if that was a Death Star outside or a lantern for about two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping for Death Star, to be honest. Right. <laughs> I had, there was something else I was staring at in the scenes with the sister, but let's not go there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's kind of a fun, like, I guess that early 60s sort of uh, Camelot utopian design is coming through a little bit here. I mean, the the implications of this future can be pretty nasty, but the look of it's pretty nice and clean and, yeah. <laughs> I've only just realized we only saw male presenting humanoids. Yeah. Well, unless we count Maxine. Oh, yeah. Well, right. The, the next uh, the next phase would would include females because that's part of the the main uh, occult. And I, I don't mean um, in a the dark sense, uh, just hidden. Uh, one of the hidden points of the plot is that they are starting to take the human bodies, right? The bodies of recently deceased humans, and they're using them to build uh, androids, humanoids, that are the next phase the next uh, rollout which will include women which they explain as being what 96 percent human because they put a number on it so it's r yeah. is it like the r46 is yeah. good enough to All be right. your um you can be in rapport with that with that 46 that's fine that's enough but um you know once you're 96 you don't even know that you are a robot <laughs> and that is one of the uh asp okay so I think we're well aware that um, the concept of making androids that are so perfect that they wouldn't even know that they're androids themselves, it was made uh, most popular in Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, right, which was made into the movie Blade Runner. But of course, this film is from six years earlier. And so it, the theme is the same. It's about androids who are made so much like humans that they don't know that they're androids. The twist, yeah, just that the twist here is that those androids were made by other androids. And that's where you, you blew my mind, just, to, you know, uh, making me aware of this film, because I'm like, whoa, they were doing that in 1962? Because, uh, again, that's not long after Forbidden Planet, so, which we do love, but doesn't certainly doesn't get into those ideas with Robbie or anything. <laughs> uh. Um. Any other points anyone wants to get on design? I guess there's not too much here because there's only five or four sets, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I already mentioned I liked the robots we saw right at the start. Um, I guess I would have liked to have seen those still knocking around a little bit during the rest of the film. Well, I think because uh, they make it clear like Kregis does work with yeah. computers, electronics, and robots. He just doesn't work with humanoid ones. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's fine with the uh, cold metal ones. He's not fine with the ones that are, trying, that are closer to humanoid. But I just love seeing robots on screen, so I would have been up for that. Yeah, although the, the robots at the beginning were pretty cardboard box. Yeah, no, that's the best. <laughs> <laughs> although I, I, it was amusing to me, this film was made so early in the existence of the word robot that the cast couldn't quite agree on how to pronounce it. So you got like robots, robots. Yeah, there's a lot of robot in this one. I did, <laughs> robots. but but the original Star Trek has a lot of uh, that sort of thing too. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, one thing as far as design, I don't know if you're going down your notes chronologically necessary, but necessarily. But I I recall you, you did mention something about the outfits. And I don't remember what I wrote. Can you can you catch me up on that? <laughs> 
You did send me a copy. I'll have to take a look. Okay, Luke's, Luke's having a look there. Um, I, I know, I mean, most of them look pretty jumpsuity. Yeah, they were somewhere between a sort of a Star Trek the motion picture uniform and something quite military. Yeah. Well, now, um, you UK boys may not recognize this, but the uh, Order of the Flesh and Blood do appear somewhat like uh, Civil War era outfits from America. Oh, oh yeah, with that that's weird an American. stitching on there, yeah. Right, that's, right, that's... right. And they carry, uh, they all carry a knife, right? Yeah. Which is a pretty outdated weapon for the future. <laughs> Unless you're in Dune. Yeah, while, while he's having a look. <laughs> oh, one, one other thing, I just, uh, I did notice that um, the Order of Flesh and Bone, or the, the Surveillance, or whatever they're called, um, their, their <laughs> meeting room uh, made me really think of the set in uh, Network. If anyone's seen Network where, um, you know, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And he's basically raving on stage. And it's sort of got that same, like, very black, you know, with a podium and stained glass look. And I, I wondered if, I wonder if Network had even seen this. It just seemed, like, really weirdly similar to me. So. I don't think I've seen that one. Yeah. Oh, you probably should. It's a good one. <laughs> so I'm trying to find your note on the uniforms now. Yeah, I don't remember what I wrote at all. Okay, so tell you what, um, read that, and then, because uh, I, I have a quote I wanted to read you after that. Okay. Okay. These future fashions rock the house, especially the red cap, says Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so that made me think of a statement by uh, the comedian Jerry Seinfeld, so let me read that for you. I hate clothes, okay? I hate buying them. I hate picking them out of my closet. I can't stand every day trying to come up with little outfits for myself. I think eventually fashion won't even exist. It won't. I think eventually we'll all be wearing the same thing. Because every time I see a movie or a TV show where there's people from the future or another planet, they're all wearing the same thing. <laughs> Somehow they decide this is going to be our outfit. One piece silver suit, V stripes and boots. That's it. We should come up with an outfit for Earth, an Earth outfit. We should vote on it. Candidates propose different outfits, no speeches. They just walk out, twirl, walk off. We just sit in the audience and go, oh, that was nice. I could wear that. <laughs> <laughs> we could do that. I, I, I guess it, you'd get a jumpsuit in the end, though. Are you called the jumpsuit? Yeah, well, that, the, there are days you'll spend in Japan where it feels like that is what's happened. Yeah. I just see all the Mitsubishi men walk by in the same jumpsuit and buy baseball caps. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm crazy because I wear black shirts to work or colorful shirts where it's, you know, in Japan it's usually white shirts. So we, we sort of do have the uniform. Yeah, yeah I, I do the same, like colorful jumper and wacky tie. But you do look at you look at the salary men and it is basically a uniform. So to, to enter the next topic, um, Luke, you, you didn't make a promise to your father upon moving to Japan, I believe. Yeah, my father did have the only piece of advice he gave me when I was going to go to my place in Japan was, Luke, please don't replace your body with robot parts. I know you want wow. to. <laughs> wow. Really? <laughs> because I always talk about it. I'm like, as soon as they bring wow. out robot legs, I'm there. I can't wait to be half robot. <laughs> I don't want to be the half. I'm on the not wanting to be half robot end here, but uh, that does bring us into the whole transhumanism concept. Um, <laughs> uh, for me, I mean, like, I have no problem with tattoos, but for me, I don't even want to like modify myself that much. Like, like, a, I, I guess I have a cool scar or two somewhere, but even that, it's like, yeah, I, I don't want to be modified. <laughs> or as I've got, I've got three tattoos, but I've had four. What happened to the fourth? They got, well, the third one got covered over by the fourth one. Ah. Because one of them was very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tattoo of my ex-girlfriend's horse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now that's where I've got a big cool lion instead. <laughs> right, right. Okay, but that, that's the point. You made the modification. Then you had to, like, modify it more, right? <laughs> yeah. 
I wish I could say that was the stupidest thing I'd done for a girl. <laughs> <laughs> but we are living in a world now where, um, you know, Elon Musk is trying to push his neural links and stuff. And I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not so keen on that sort of thing. I'm not keen on it because it's coming from Elon Musk. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, any for-profit company is not going anywhere near my brain or my nervous system. But okay. <laughs> if they want to give me a super strong hand, that's cool. He, he did say that with artificial intelligence, we are summoning a demon. I mean, that's how he chose to put it. Well, if you listen to Kurzweil, the demon's arriving in, what, 2048? <laughs> yeah, and then Musk is kind of putting us in a catch-22 situation where he proposes becoming cyborgs in order to survive the AI. I mean... <laughs> so, I guess the, the creation of the humanoids is either at the singularity or very close to it. I mean, that's, was it 2046, 2048? What's the date they threw on that? Does anyone remember? I don't remember them giving a date. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, it was a while back, but... Uh, and, uh, you, oh, okay, so, I thought you were talking about the film. No, no, I, no, I'm Ray Kurzweil, the, the kind of futurist dude. Um, yeah, I'm aware of the concept of the singularity. I didn't know anyone had named a date before. He it. put the date somewhere in the late 2040s, and mm -hmm. um, this movie is... where? Where is this movie? Is it past the singularity? No, the singularity is about to happen, I think, is the point, right? Is procreation Well, wait, are you talking about the singularity where humans join it or just where the ai exists i think that's where the ai basically surpasses I've human heard both intelligence views, right? yeah yeah i think that uh, by singularity is what's referred to generally as strong artificial intelligence so for instance we have plenty of artificial intelligence already but a strong would imply um, a self-conscious artificial intelligence it's also called general artificial intelligence so it, it would seem that this movie is uh right at that spot because what is happening is that the humanoids are taking uh, matters into their own hands and, and doing things for which they were not programmed right so or as the as the movie puts it for which they were not circuited mm. <laughs> according to according to wikipedia wikipedia the technological singularity is a hypothetical point in time at which technological growth becomes irreversible okay so it's when the ai we can't stop it getting better anymore. Right, so in, right. in this case, when they start procreating, it's now irreversible. Well, in this film, that's already been happening for a while, right? Not the procreation. No, but the... 96%. They, they are... Cre no, but the... They can't procreate like we do. But the humanoids are already designing new humanoids. Yeah, they're designing Human, the Humans higher. are barely involved now in the process of improving the humanoids. So... Yeah, I guess they're like in the midst of the singularity here. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and, and keep in mind also that um, the movie's intro states 92% of the human race had perished to bomb and radiation. And due to the atomic wars, then those left with their birth rate below 1.4 per union, right? So that's that's part of the movie's big plot is that human population is very low and not getting any better because uh, there's so many mutants, as uh, Craig has puts it, <laughs> mutants. Well, as a microcosm, Japan is living that. Like Japan, well, A, was nuked, but the, um, the population is declining, not because of radiation, just because people aren't getting laid, but to the point that they are trying to replace people with robots. Yeah, so Japan... this film pretty much predicted, like, the next 50 years of Japan, at least, if not the rest of the world. Yeah, just a month or two ago, they were testing, like, convenience store restocking robots in Tokyo. So, <laughs> these kind of oh. black things just brrr, and go and do the drink machines and all that. So, uh, I think there, a few of them are supposed to go on practical online next year. So, Whereas, of oh. course, this is all just because they're too racist to just hire Korean and Chinese people to do these jobs. But Although Japan is... Well, they were starting to they were starting to bring in more foreign workers, but that's been a bit curbed. In yeah, now no one's doing that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it is. It, this film predicted that possible future. Like like many sci fi's, the film assumed that some terrible tragedy had to happen, whereas actually people will often just do these crazy things all by ourselves. So as a society reaches a point of like contentedness, people are no longer so invested in having children. The population will decline and maybe we will have to turn to robots hmm. that reminds me of uh, maybe i'll get into part of a discussion that's had within this movie which is very interesting because it pertains to politics if you if you recall that when when they're having that what you refer to as a party in that apartment right 
or, or maybe we should uh, back up to the rapport because the reason that the humanoid is there because he's in rapport with Kragus' sister, which of course cr uh, freaked out Kragus because he's uh, against humanoids, but he finds out his sister is very much into them. Yeah. Well, because she, she says that she'd previous had a husband who I think the film very right. strongly implies was abusive. Right. And she's turned to a robot, who, well, a humanoid who right. can't so, treat her that way. Right. So the movie refers to marriages amongst humans as contracting. <laughs> How romantic, you know. Um, uh, and then it refers to human marriages to humanoids as uh, rapport, being in rapport. So Kragus, of course, freaks out and goes to confront his sister. And uh, incidentally, I found that um, funny. Uh, his name's actually Kenneth Kragus, right? Another Ken. Uh, but he says uh, he used to be Kragus Jr., right? But if, when his dad died, then they started referring to him as the the Kragus. Right. It, it seems he had like intentionally dropped his first name, like no one had used it in years. <laughs> hmm. No, in fact, I, I only know his name's Kenneth because I looked up the cast. I'm not sure it's even used in the movie. I think the sister brings it up, like you used to be Kenneth, and then they kind of drop okay, it. Okay, right? yeah, it back. was Kenneth, or was it? Yeah. When yeah. my father died, when my father died, I dropped it. I became the Kragus. Right. Which Weird. does almost sound like a Lovecraftian beast of some kind. <laughs> well, then, uh, yeah. <laughs> from lines like that, and also when he was hitting on the other woman. Um, I got the impression that like breeding is very controlled, controlled and almost eugenic in this society, because so few children can be born. So he's like, "Oh, I can't enter a contract with you because I can't have kids." Right, right. But then um, they've also. I feel like, like, I guess in the nineteen fifties, early sixties, since the word like their quote romance would make sense mm. or not make sense, but be normal. I guess it doesn't make any sense until you. Um, Oh, there's only, what, 15 of these R96s. So the fact that they met and, like, they were just attracted because they were both. Yeah. Like, they could see the um, mechanical spark in each other. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> At first, when they said, like, oh, I love you, I was like, excuse me? This is, like, King Kong all over again. You've only been on screen together for two minutes. But <laughs> for once, for one of these old films, they actually did try and explain that. <laughs> So this is a discussion amongst the four of them, but it'll, it'll mostly turn out to be the humanoid and Kragus. Maxine is an authority on political science. Her father's a director at the Ministry of Politics. Something I've wondered about. Things are run by the hierarchy of ministries. What is the exact function of the Ministry of Politics? For the coordination of the other ministries. Then too, they service the selector. Politics was once the means of choosing the leaders. Now the machines do it. Which uh, is interesting considering how many problems we have in the USA over, uh, you know, the machines that we use to vote and whether they're accurately keeping track and all of that stuff. Machines merely analyze the data given to them by us. The leaders are selected as a result of that analysis. Do you know how the machine analyzes the data? I, well, well, no, not exactly. Then how do you know if the father-mother uses all the data you give it? How do you know whether or not supplementary data is considered? We... we don't. Then you might almost say that the machines elect the leaders, that the Ministry of Politics is expendable. Wow. One, they definitely made the, the ministries, had me thinking of Orwell, Ministry of Love and all that. <laughs> and... Maybe y'all can check my history. I feel like the first time in America we really got wild on the voting machines was the Chads in 2000. Yeah, yeah. The but that chad. was still analog machines. A kind of paper voting. It wasn't through the computer. Yeah, it was right. But it was analog computing, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So, and and yeah, now the thing is, uh, now we're um, sending in votes, or we're just living in Japan, or <laughs> I, I, I've seen some friends actually going to vote, but yeah, it's it, especially this year, you're like, where are those votes going? <laughs> well, even in the Democratic primary, there was the whole thing with the shadow software. The, the what? The, the program they were using, which, this isn't ominous at all, is called Shadow. Yeah, that's what <laughs> was, I was like, what? Um, <laughs> it was... There was like some funky business where they don't know if all the votes went through properly. 
and it declared the winner before it was actually ready to declare and made it look like Biden had lost. Hmm. And then it turned out that the um, the company that made this software had received big old piles of cash from Pete Buttigieg. So <laughs> well, that's it was all very suspicious that you're trying to get these computers involved and who knows well, where beyond, your votes are actually going. Beyond voting, when we put something into Google... I mean, how much information is Google using or not using to give us back our results? Just right? now, when I typed the singularity, the first thing it suggested was the singularity is near. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Google's trying to tell me something. Yeah, I was talking directly to you in that case. So. <laughs> at, at least once a year, I just type into Google, are you alive? Are you sentient? <laughs> to see if it says yes yet. <laughs> Yeah, I think a year or two ago, and I didn't. I, I've now gotten to the. I don't. I don't even want to take surveys. Frame of mind, right? I, I, I've told. I said on the podcast before. All my likes on Facebook are now Kenny Rogers. But, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's kind of like, is Google create? You know, Google has so much information on us. I mean, they could almost like make a humanoid of half of us now. Well, there's a huge amount of today's problems are just caused by we're just letting algorithms do all the jobs that humans should be doing. Yeah. So, you know, these online forums and social media platforms, no person is going through and checking for abuse and Nazism and all of this stuff. They've written a program that's supposed to get rid of it, but obviously lots of stuff slips through the cracks. Who watches the watchers? Yeah. (laughs) No one. That's the thing. (laughs) And then, you know, you try and even just go on YouTube just to watch some entertainment. You're trusting it to throw up things that it thinks you'll like. And it, it does shape what you like. People, you know, you start off, I just want to watch my favorite video game. Then you get someone saying why, oh, well, your video game's been ruined by the feminists. <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're a white supremacist. So. <laughs> <laughs> Have any of you uh, guys seen uh, the sequel to, Bat- or prequel to Battlestar Galactica, Caprica? No, because I keep wanting to finish Battlestar first. You gotta finish that. I anyway, uh, sorry, can I? I'm gonna. Yo, go ahead. It's I, the first episode. The robots take over. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, inventor's daughter is killed in a terrorist attack, mm. but she had left enough of an algorithm that there's a AI digital created version, or basically an internet space, right? Which is then later transferred to a mechanical robot. I mean, that's just the plot of Astro Boy. Yeah, but it's darker in Caprica. But he didn't have the... Okay, Astro Boy right? gets pretty dark, man. <laughs> okay. Was Astro, uh, was Astro Boy a boy before he was an Astro Boy? Yeah. Okay. He's, a, he's um, a boy and his son dies and he builds a robot version. Okay. And tries okay. to recreate him. If again. he had the algorithms, it's the same then. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, it, before the word algorithm existed, but it, he bases it on his memories of his son, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's the um, Superman's Fortress of Solitude as well. It's an AI of his dad, right? And he gets, he interacts with it in real time, but it's based on algorithms of his dad. Well, that's also, I keep bringing up Star Trek Picard. That's also how, a big spoiler coming up if you haven't watched Star Trek Picard yet. That's how that ends, is they build a robot body and put Picard's mind into it based on like a brain scan. I think the writer of Picard had watched this film. Very possible. I'm seeing more and more like, oh, actually... This is kind of more influential than I thought. <laughs> yes, I think so. In fact, there's. Um, I wanted to read another bit of dialogue, if I could. Um, and by the way, uh, there was something in the notes, again, something somewhere in the notes you wrote about the dialogue in the movie. And I found that there was very little, if any, dialogue in the entire movie that's not substantive. They were... Well, there was very little dialogue because they were just taking turns to do monologues. Yeah, but someone <laughs> but, yeah, definitely took it the was, time. They it took was the time on this. That's kind of what we we're talking about. What we were talking about at the start, mm-hmm. that it's very heavily written. So many ideas in here, so they're constantly saying really interesting stuff. You just don't really see it. A- anyway, you got some interesting stuff for us, do you? <laughs> With your quote. Yeah. Well, um, so in the movie Automata, that there's a existential scene where um again it's a it's a world dealing with not uh, atomic war in this case but um the sun um becoming overactive and human population going down that whole trope so there's a scene where the robot is speaking to a human and the human recognizes that uh, their humans are on the way out and that the robots are becoming self-aware and they have a whole discussion that uh, ends up being, as far as I can tell, just like, again, a watered-down rewrite 
of some of the thing um, of the dialogue I'm going to read here. So I'll start with Craig as says he's kind of explaining some of the problems he has with humanoids. Machines do all the work for us. Why should we learn mathematics when the computers can find the solutions better and faster? We don't even control them anymore. The brains are designed by other brains. The robots improve themselves. We don't know how. We give them data, they give us answers. We only supply means to your ends. Yeah, our end. Every day and every way, we're becoming weaker and weaker. And you're helping us over the hill. We are over the hill. I can't stop us. Neither can you. First, there were the plants. They developed into animals which ate the plants. The animals were small, but they grew. And the larger animals ate the smaller animals. What does that mean? So far, according to history, each dynasty devises its own end. The animal develops a brain, and the brain destroys the animal. Our brains conceived you, robots. Are you threatening to destroy us? Oh, no. We are by no means sure that we are the next step. It's just that in view of the cycle, we are the best we have to offer to help you. The cycle is rather inexorable. That's treason. No, it isn't. It's logic. I have to be logical. And incidentally, there's another line I absolutely adore where he says, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm circuited to be logical and yet not to offend. That sometimes poses an insoluble problem. Well, yeah, you're dealing with uh, variables like people. You don't really know how that's going to roll. <laughs> yeah, they're not always right, logical. So, so you see that the, the humanoid is just viewing um, the cycle of, well, he's proposing a, a naturalistic worldview, obviously, and he's just seeing cycles. And he's saying, you know, you humans are on the way out, just like other things before you have gone out, out of existence. Uh, but no, we don't we don't know if the humanoids are the next step. And actually, of course, we end up finding out that the next step is going to be a combination of human and and, and humanoid. Right. Yeah. At the very end. I think I found Matt's line that you were asking about just now. He said um, they overwrote this movie. It's not an insult. Interesting for a B movie. There you go. Which I think is very true. This film has been. Very, very written. Yeah, because the movies for usually good or are bad. lightly written. But I, it's, I almost feel like Craig's uh, speech that, that uh, you just read there is almost, Luke, what you were kind of saying with In Time, like a couple months ago, talking about you can understand how an analog car works, right? How the gears work. But, right. you know, like the iPhone, we ask it questions, but it's magic. We don't know what's going on in there. <laughs> so, like a lot of us could almost make that same speech now, for, for better or for worse. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But keep in mind, too, this is in the 60s. And I mean, older movies, a unique feature of older movies is a tremendous amount of dialogue or monologue, if you must uh, have it that way, <laughs> where you have a, like a 20 minute scene of nothing but two people's faces talking to each other. That's it. And that there was something to that. So that's why I think there's so much uh, in this movie that is substantive. Like I said, hardly anything is wasted words or fluff or puff. It's it's all very uh, purposeful. That's so rare now, especially in a sci-fi film. <laughs> um, True. I, I want to press, you know, like, again, Metropolis has it. Dr. Strangelove has it. This has it. I want to press that occultist uh, button here because that's not, you know, most people wouldn't watch this and just like get that. So can, can you break down a little bit of um, your, your view on the sort of occultist end here? Well, for one, uh, the thing that just should hit us right in the face is that the uh, the humanoids are taking human corpses and using them to build up the next generation of humanoids. So it's sort of a high tech resurrection, if you will. And they are doing that in part based on the, like I said, the theology that they're concocting with, they now have a temple where they go and receive uh, energies, right? <laughs> and they're dealing in information. There's, uh, um, there's an explanation about this, that when they go into the temple, they're not only having their batteries recharged, but they're uh, downloading the information that they've learned since the last time they were there. 
uh, into the father mother and they're getting uploaded with uh, the information that they need to perform their tasks you know so there's this kind of uh Gnostic Sophia aspect, meaning uh, knowledge and wisdom that they're exchanging there. And um, and so, of course, th that's the point is because of this theology that they're concocting, they're starting to form a worldview that is beyond uh, human or beyond uh, just technical, but it's like emerging. Like I said, hu transhumanism, high tech occult and evolution, and that's this movie has it all. It has all of it. Yeah, I guess a few of the things that struck me on that end was sort of the, the I guess, the Egyptian resurrection idea. I mean, we're not 100% sure that's what they were doing, but the idea that maybe in the pyramid people were like, you know, having some, like, in a way dying. It could be through substances. It could be through weird energies. We don't know. And then kind of being dazed and let out to see the, the sunlight after three days, the uh, the. Uh, notable three days there but the whole fact here there's a certain amount of time that they have to resurrect these humans before it's no good um there's that adjustment period when they have been brought back like it's not just boom here they are they're kind of dazed and weird for a while which uh, has a lot to do with some of the i guess the initiation possible initiation rights i mean half of this is conjecture or, or or guesses anyway i think well in in the like the gnostic sense your experiencing your death is meant to be what awakens you but in this, they were saying they, if they remember their death, they can't function. So, so they have to have some time in their new body before they can accept that they were killed. Okay, so beforehand. they're right. missing that moment. Mm. Because that was Dr. Raven's whole technique, was that he made them forget the death. Yeah. Yes, right. So there's two aspects of a memory uh, and memory, memory manipulation, which to me just stinks of mind control in, in any way you look at it. Uh, there's uh, actually, if I may, I'll just read a little more of the script. But yeah, what they did find is that it was such a shock for the humanoids to um, basically be high tech resurrected that it was so shocking to them, they malfunctioned. So then the doctor, right, like you said, he had to uh, meddle with their memories and have them forget that experience, which is why they ended up being humanoids who didn't know they were humanoids. They just thought, oh, I passed out and now I'm fine, right? Now, when uh, if you recall the scene where the, the doctor, which uh, I got a kick of how you are so focused on his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> it was notable. Uh, you, you know, if, if you can't watch this on YouTube, you can just project it off of his forehead and watch it that way. <laughs> right on. <laughs> but, but so that when the, when, uh, the doctor uh, is visited by a humanoid. The Ministry of Information doesn't want it known that robots are dealing in robots. But only give the flesh and blood something more to yell about. They're a minority. A loud minority. Your supplier, will they take his identity? His memory will be dispersed tomorrow. So that's kind of a punishment that they use in this uh, society is uh, when this person was caught dealing in robots, right? They disperse memory. So it's like um, imposed amnesia, right? What a waste. Why don't they just kill him? The effect of personal cessation is the same in either case. They just leave a hollow shell walking around. He can still perform his duties. But he's without a past, without hope, the dream gone. Almost like being a robot, isn't it? No offense. I'm incapable of taking offense. But why is it the more we become like men, the more some of them hate us for it? Men hate what they fear. You have perfect memory, infallible logic. You never tire. You're circuited against anger and violence. And in your world, that leaves us pretty helpless. We have to study for years to learn what you pick up by plugging into a brain for two hours. We don't refer to the father-mother as a brain. Your father-mother is an electronic computer, just a machine. Your parents were machines. It's just that they were engineered with flesh and bones. Neither are ideal components. You came off a production line. I know who created me. Hollister Evans in the Mark 47. You have to accept your creator on faith. Who created your creator? 
Yours? You see, we are brothers, aren't we? I ought to know better than to argue with you clickers. Can't beat your logic. And then they mention, by the way, that humans aren't allowed to set foot in the robot temple. That's part of the reason why they're... I mean, that that's literally an occult initiation, right? Humans aren't allowed in there. They're, they're not allowed into this temple, and that's part of why the robots are getting away with doing so many things behind the scenes. Yeah, I know. I, I went to Baraka once, and I was walking down to Medina and Fez, and, you know, we were, like, politely turned away from, from a mosque area because we weren't allowed in there, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised, actually, in this world's logic that the robots were allowed a place to themselves. Well, there's, I guess, the builders are gone. Uh, uh, the, the, who created them, they're pretty yeah. much gone. It's like, uh, you know, we have technologies now that no one really understands anymore. Yeah, um, yeah, a lot of, particularly on the internet, things are built on code I mean, no one remembers writing. <laughs> but see, it's... The, the premise is that, for instance, why would you want to go into a room where a bunch of computers are plugged into a wall, right? These humanoids were just supposed to go in there to recharge their batteries. There was literally nothing to see here. But for some reason, eventually it became that humans were actually not allowed in there. And we don't really know who disallowed that. It's just kind of stated. Yeah, I mean, if the, if the computers are choosing who's leading, right? So <laughs> they probably have a bit of a say in how these things go. Although... You know, now, now that I think about it, maybe a hidden plot is that uh, somebody became afraid that the flesh and blooders, you know, as they call them, might infiltrate the temple. So maybe that's part of the reason why no humans were allowed in there, just to, to, to cease, to not um, allow the, the chance of them causing any trouble, like I said, including a, a terrorist act. Well, yes, it's fairly reasonable. I, I guess uh, we've already had some talk today about how this holds up, and it, as a movie, yeah, yeah it's definitely a, a schlocky Owen, but yeah, those ideas are just so, I mean, they're still ahead of their time. This, yes. This is, I mean, this is stuff we actually need to, like, be <laughs> thinking about in 2020. Well, and the more I think about the thing, the ideas in this film, the more I realize that they have been absorbed by other cultures since then. Like, the whole idea of the machines developing their own theology that kind of comes up in things like Battlestar, The Matrix, even some of the more obscure like Terminator stuff. Um, but yeah, this seems to have been the origin of that concept. And, and incidentally, at one point it's stated uh, that the series 21 through 70 are the humanoids. Yes. And, and it states that the humanoids represent only about 20% of a billion odd robots. Yeah, the rest of them are just like we saw in the opening, the clunky machine ones. Right. Which, again, I'm so upset I didn't get to see more of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, uh, you just mentioned Battlestar, where they show that these um, these alive Cylon ships are definitely, like, they're like a, a cow or a horse compared to these humanoid Cylons that, you know, so kind of the same thing in the Battlestar, where probably maybe 20% are actually these um, walking and talking ones. And the others are on lower forms of uh, their own hierarchy created by themselves. And of course, again, the, the ultimate goal is to, okay, so humanity is basically deconstructing at this point. And so the, the ultimate plot is a reconstruction of humanity made in the humanoid's own image, which again, would be a combination of human and humanoid, so a, a styled uh, cyborg, essentially, who can self-reproduce, by the way. That was the big reveal at the end. And that's why Maxine and the Kragus were uh, essentially um, almost uh, circuited, right, programmed to fall in love with each other as instantly as they did, because they were supposed to be the uh, first models in a new generation or the, the latest 100 generation of the humanoids who could actually reproduce.
I guess we're going in the dock. Um, Luke, do you have any other any other major points you want to plonk out? No, I'm just trying to remember what other films and things I've seen where the robots end up reproducing like that. Does Bicentennial Man get someone pregnant by the end? I haven't seen that one, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, before we end, we should um, just go through some of the very end of the movie because it's very uh, telling. But I wanted th- to throw out there... My most recent book is a review of the first season of a new show called Raised by Wolves. And boy, talk about uh, transhumanism and um, everything that comes with. You have it right there. Um, Androids, um, uh, uh, raising humans, uh, everything. It's got got everything. Everything we've been talking about kind of um, in in a... in a new light, but the old, the same old story as uh, creation of the humanoids. Hmm, I haven't heard of that one. I've heard the name bandied around a bit, but yeah, I, if there's a TV show I really need to get to, I'll get to it. But yeah, I, I, I commit to movies most of the time. I, my attention spans do. It's good for reading. It's bad for movies. I guess it's good. <laughs> Frankly, a lot of uh, shows, I know I, I, I date myself when I say TV shows, you know, I have to say something like, uh, Wi-Fi streaming programs or something. <laughs> no one's come but, up with a good word yet, so everyone still just says yeah. TV show. <laughs> but I find the series, to me, that gosh, they're just so drawn out. And you know they're drawing them out on purpose because they got to fill in uh, 10 episodes per season or something. It's like, come on already. Just get get to the bottom line already. <laughs> yeah, I do miss just episodic TV shows where you can sit down and get a whole story in your 45 minutes. <laughs> that never seemed like... we. I often complained when we were watching Picard. I liked that story. It didn't need to be 10 hours long. <laughs> Yeah, it could have been like a double episode of uh, something. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, as, as far as the humanoids, it's you know you, you gotta you gotta pay attention to it. it. It's not quite a. If you sit down, and relax, you're gonna watch like a cheesy sci-fi film. If you pay attention, you're gonna get quite a bit out of it. Yes. Yeah. Often when we go back to an older film like this, our advice is like you know go back, switch off your brain, enjoy a romp. But this one's the opposite. It's like, okay, sit down with this one like to watch a film. <laughs> and maybe you'll come away with, it with some new ideas and with lots of thoughts rattling around in your head. And if the production seems a little weird, just ignore that part in this case. Usually you're there for it. You could, al- you could almost just listen to this one like a, an audio play, like a podcast. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's not many scenes where you're meant to be looking at anything in particular. I guess we're walking That's that true. line today. <laughs> um. Ken, did you have any other big points you wanted to put out on this film? No, just uh, to, to detail the uh, ending scene. Okay, so the Kragus and Maxine end up inside of the temple, right? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and uh, guess who's, who's there is uh, the big forehead doctor, who, by the way, we find out had... Um, you mentioned it already. He... He requested that a humanoid kill him because they were about to get busted and he didn't want one of the ministries to, to find out what he's been doing. So he had him, himself killed on purpose, knowing that no big deal. You're just going to be high tech resurrected. And the, incidentally, they made him uh, look a little younger, as it's pointed out. And uh, <laughs> one of the things that kills me is, uh, OK, so. Maxine and the Kragus are in the temple and they're, they're, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, there's the, the, you know, the ultimate scene where the end, the humanoids are talking to them and um, the doctor is explaining, we perform a thalamic transplant, but that's a misnomer. We draw off everything that makes a man particular to himself, his learning, his memory, his inner reacting uh, constitute, his personality, his philosophy, capabilities, and attitudes. And then as they're going uh, through the process of what they're actually doing behind the scenes, um, the humanoid kind of motions to his humanoid buddy, like, tell him, you know, and so he goes, Kragus, you are a robot. Which actually, uh, he wasn't. He's a, he's a next generation humanoid, but okay. It was a good line anyway. You are a robot. And Craig says, a clicker. 
Me? <laughs> now isn't that something? And then um, it's pointed out, incidentally, in this scene that there's only 15 robots on this planet capable of acting against a human being. That's kind of interesting. And that's stated because in order to kind of prove to Kragus that he's actually a humanoid, one of the humanoids stabbed him. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. He, he kind of, there's a really interesting scene where the humanoid puts his hands out and all of a sudden the Kragus' metal knife is in his hand and he stabs him and well, green blood comes out, right? And so they tell him, you are one of them. Maxine is another. The, when they're explaining what had happened, which is that Kragus had uh, bombed one of the ministries and Maxine died. So that's how they got her corpse. And then they tell Maxine, <laughs> they tell her, we barely got you in time. We did make you a bit thinner. You had a tendency to be plump. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. You think she would have noticed. So there you go. It, it's the... Uh, it's the high tech resurrection of the, the diet. Man, that was uh, just outrageous. She says, That's right. After that, my clothes didn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> they did Man, accept was... very quickly that they were now um, uh, artificial. Well, I feel like Kragus re resisted it for quite a while. That was like his whole. Once he found out, though, he, it didn't See. take him too long. <laughs> but, uh, like three minutes. I, it reminded me of like a stoner when he's going, like, but I used to have little hands. <laughs> but yeah, Maxine was just like, oh, great. Now I can eat what I want and stay thin. She's pretty happy with the situation. <laughs> Good for her. I, I, it seems to me it would be indicative of the fact that they actually are not fully human. So that, okay, such uh, human concerns would be much easier to, for them to handle now. And then there is the talk about um, the shock of dying and being resurrected as a robot was too severe. They re-died. A sort of adjustment period was needed, like we talked about earlier, right? And so it seems like, well, okay, now we recognize we're humanoids, and because of that, they're able to just kind of accept it and, and move on, right? Instantly, almost. But to me, that, that does make sense. If I found out tomorrow, like, oh, you've been a robot for two years, I could probably accept it because in those two years I've had lots of experiences. If I found out tomorrow I just became a robot, I would start questioning, like, can I still feel this? Can I still feel that? Am I still human? So that does kind of make sense. I, I guess my, my last question here then would be, what, what is everyone take, everyone's take? Are these people actually dead? Well, the, there's a... I wanted to read uh, the very end, which is extremely theologically important. Um, but yeah, they see that that's kind of the uh, the trick is to figure out what exactly they're talking about. So it seems as if when they got the corpse, which we mentioned already, they had to do pretty quickly, right? Because if not, you have uh, too much breaking down of the genetic material. And so what they seem to be saying is that they're using some of the contents of the human's brain to build upon when they um, create a humanoid so that the person wakes up and they think nothing's happened. They just passed out or whatever because they have all those old memories and everything. So it's a, it's a combination of, of human and machine. That's what they're ultimately doing. Again, to the point, to the point where they can reproduce with each other biologically. Yeah, I guess it goes back to, I mean, if you're going to say mind-body duality, then this is a recreation. The mind is something else. If you're like the mind is a product of the brain, then using the genetic material, I mean, this is the actual person. Yeah, this is a very materialist view of humans in this film. Yeah. <laughs> because they seem to accept that, yeah, if you copy across what the brain was doing to this other thing, that's the person. Right. But, okay, let us let me read this now. Uh, so Craig is, is kind of resigned to the fact that he's a, 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 a humanoid, and he says... So the machines take over. Craig, is, is it true that there will be nothing but machines? That we are machines? Yes. Yes, it's true. Machines. 
you're a beautiful machine. You know beauty. How do you feel toward Maxine? I, I love her. And you? I love him very much. And that's a lot for a couple of godless, soulless robots. Are you godless, Kragus? Search yourself, it's important. Are you godless? No. No, I don't think so. I'm not. Then you can't be soulless. Look, a man may have his leg amputated. Is his soul decreased by that loss? No. Not even a fraction of 1%? Of course not. What if a man loses both legs? A negative can't be compounded. The soul would be the same. You'd just get artificial legs. You've just received an artificial body. A new body. Ageless. Tireless. Disease-free and renewable every 200 years. I guess nothing has changed except maybe a few chemicals. In effect. Well, a transplant must include the soul. No, only the memory which includes the faith that there is a soul. Whatever it is, you seem to have it. And when the entire human race has been transplanted, death will cease to exist. And birth will cease to exist, too. The most precious hope of every woman. How do you think these two R96s would like to pick up four points? You can raise them to R100s? Make them propagate themselves? I worked it all out prior to my recent death and resurrection. I didn't want to turn it over to you until I didn't need you anymore. Now I don't since we're all on the same side. How about it, you two? It'll take several simple operations. Hardly more difficult than removing a rib. Somebody has to be first. Self-procreating. It's a pretty sloppy way of doing things, but it fulfills a certain psychological need. Paradoxical, isn't it? I spend my life seeking immortality on one hand and seeking to destroy it on the other. I love you, Gregus. Of course, the operation was a success. Or, or you, you wouldn't, wouldn't be, be here. here as he turns to the screen, right, to the audience and says that. So it implies that the audience are all this next level of humanoids because the only reason they're there watching this uh, this movie is because the operation was successful and the human population, you know, these sort of uh, hybrid human humanoids reproduce to the point that now there's enough of us that we can enjoy this movie. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And again, well, that was incredibly theological right there and existential and all, all of it bound together, right? And more recently, we have Battlestar walking the same walk, basically. So <laughs> it definitely does stick around. To me, that more or less fit, fit with my philosophical beliefs, because I am mostly pretty materialist that we are, you know, a flesh and blood body creating a mind. But I also don't necessarily think that means that a soul doesn't exist or a theological component doesn't exist. I just think we create it ourselves. So, well, then you would have to pre-exist your own existence. Yeah. Or if we go ahead and maybe the soul has a lot to do with imagination. <laughs> yeah. Being able to imagine the idea is part of and, and they can still imagine. They can imagine the future of their race and so forth. And the humanoids themselves can actually have quite a bit of imagination taking their own initiative. So Yeah. Yeah, and then you're like, which which number of humanoid does does that start clicking in with? So clicking, oops, there's a click. <laughs> it did sound That's more offensive. and more offensive each time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they said it. <laughs> Sci-fi uh, films love making their own slurs for robots. Yeah. <laughs> Clickers, skin jobs. <laughs> 
Well, yeah. Go to uh, real life transhumanist, you know, with the artilect, you know, and all of that. What else? Um, yeah, speaking of the soul, I, I recalled uh, when I looked at your notes that uh, there was a short lived remake of the TV show V. Remember from the oh, I 80s? Kind of remember, yeah. I definitely know the 80s one. I'm not sure. No, I, I remember this remake. remake coming out. I don't think I watched any of okay. it. <laughs> well, it was on t- it was kind of short lived, but by the end of it, they had the aliens build engineering a machine that would extract the human soul from the body. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so it's like a high tech, um, I don't know, a, a high tech reverse exorcism or something. I mean. Why, what are aliens doing coming to Earth to extract human souls from our bodies? That sounds like some Scientology stuff to me. <laughs> yeah. It's like, for me, I guess I guess I could be convinced to put a copy of myself in the, in the virtual world. Right. But I don't want to take the trip myself. <laughs> that, um, that, they do that a lot in the Ian M. Banks culture novels. You, like, you put a copy out into another physical body, or, and then later on it comes back and gives those memories to you. Oh, okay, that's interesting, sure. <laughs> anyway, I, I guess we actually we need to be winding down soon. So, uh, uh, Ken, can you tell our listeners a little bit about uh, where they can find some of your material and, and your books and so forth? Sure, I make it very easy. Uh, just go to truefreethinker.com, all one word, truefreethinker. Uh, and anything you could want is there. You know, I, I hear these guys when they're asked questions like that, they spend five minutes. Twitter this, Facebook that, YouTube this. Look, just go to truefreethinker.com and everything's there, including if you'll allow me to do a little uh, self-promotion. Can I read the title of my uh, movie review books? Yeah, of course. No, absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the one that contains this movie is called Transhuman Hollywood from um, normative fiction to predictive programming. And then one called A Worldview Review of Stephen King's It, the mystical, mysterious, and metaphysical in the novel, miniseries, and movies. And then A Worldview Review of the Alien and Predator Mythos franchises. Uh, I always joke that the research for that book was watching 13 movies, but uh, let me tell you, that was a lot of hard work. And then, of course, Raised by Wolves, War of the World Views and Examination of Season 1. And so uh, I'm actually writing another book as we speak, essentially. Uh, this one will be about movies that have uh, themes of aliens and UFOs. Because I'm definitely interested in the Alien and Predator one, although those films vary quite wildly in quality. So <laughs> I can imagine that was quite a trip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, I included the crossover movies as well. And someone told me, oh, well, those aren't canon. I, like, I could care less. <laughs> yeah. You I, know? I yeah. saw someone making They're part it. of the story to me. Yeah. I saw someone making like, it was like a chart of like the alien franchise chronologically, which was pretty hysterical. <laughs> Parts were just scratched out. And <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Um, Matt, with with all your writing, uh, Luke and I feel a touch lazy, but we we do some other stuff. <laughs> well, you know, you were complaining about those guys who reel off all their social medias. You're gonna have to do that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> if you like this podcast, you can find it on Twitter at MLSFS Pod. We're also on Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, all of that. Just search Matt and Luke Sci Fi Sanctuary. If you want to hear more of my voice for some reason, I do two other podcasts. You can find my Pokemon podcast at Luke Loves PKMN. Or my Monster Hunter podcast at Monster Mash Pod. And if you like the music you've heard in this episode, you can find Matt's music at rovingsagemedia.bandcamp.com. You got that so down now. I yeah, I know. I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, we, oh, we got a little bit of a squib on the connection. Uh, if we're going to get connection issues right at the end is a good time for it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, Ken, thank you very much for joining us today and, and for um, being quite well prepared. You seem to be the most... Uh, yeah, you really did comment. end up hosting this podcast for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you for that and for uh, spending a, a little more than an hour with us today. So, um, Luke, how, how shall people enter the, the temple today, the sanctuary, whatever it is? Well, uh, Ken, you and the listeners at home, you're not bald. You are human, so I'm afraid you need to get out of our temple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see how long I, I go bald. Yeah. <laughs>